and welcome back to the channel. Today's video is going to be a little different. Uh, not only are you not hanging out with Dan, you have me, but we are also going to be looking at a different category of 3D printing resin. When it comes to resin 3D printing, it's generally accepted knowledge that you have to be careful with what you use resin for. By this I mean that you wouldn't print yourself a spoon and bowl for your morning cereal or anything else that you would eat off of because the materials aren't food safe. You would also want to pause before printing anything that would be food adjacent, like a part for your dishwasher or a container for your dry goods. However, all that being said, there are specific 3D printing resins that are food safe and some that are even biocompatible. For some of you, this probably isn't a huge shock as you've already heard of them, or you're just thinking about all of the various safe plastics we have in virtually every aspect of our modern food and drink system. Plastics are also used in medical and dental applications in and outside of the human body almost every single day. So what exactly are resin manufacturers in the 3D printing space doing to catch up to all these other plastics and make something that is truly biocompatible? And on the flip side of that question, are most companies even bothering? Before we jump into that huge question, let's quickly just review what 3D printing resin actually is. In any given bottle of resin, you can find a mixture of monomers, crosslinkers, fillers, plasticizers, pigments, and initiators. Uh, Goobertown Hobbies has actually done some great videos on the basics of what makes up a resin, so definitely go check out their channel uh, to get more in depth on that. For our purposes today in this video, what we really need to understand is that each one of these chemicals needs to be something compatible with the human body to a certain threshold in order for the resin to properly be given the moniker of food safe or biocompatible. Each one of these ingredients uh, can react with the human body on its own or in combination with the other chemicals in the resin. As an example, common phosphine oxide-based photoinitiators are known to be toxic. However, they're used in a variety of different resin formulas. Some are even given FDA approval if the quantity of the photoinitiator is low enough. Given that information, it's important to recognize that similarly to the terms non-toxic, low odor, biodegradable, the terminologies of food safe and biocompatible are sometimes used as blanket terms. And unless they're backed up by testing, can mean very little. Thanks to Mac4D who sent us this bottle of Splint, which kind of ended up kicking off this whole journey, we now have a decent understanding of what testing should be done in order to authentically represent a product as biocompatible. This material is designed to be used for dental applications, creating splints, as the name implies. A splint is a form-fitted cover that goes over your teeth to prevent grinding, which eases muscle tension, uh, wear and tear, and basically protects your teeth. This material has been tested to a high standard going so far as the cellular level for long-term use in the human mouth. Long-term in this case means at most two years of use. The testing, Mac4D, uh, B9 Creations, and other companies undergo are categorized under the ISO 10993-1. I think I got that right. Uh, which is an FDA biocompatibility guideline. This guideline outlines 12 different standards for testing that can be done on biocompatible materials, or rather materials that are intended to be labeled as biocompatible. Now, I'm not a chemical engineer, uh, but I can tell you for those companies that are following the FDA guideline, the resin may undergo testing for reproductive toxicity, skin irritation, interactions with blood, and various other long-term and short-term tests to look at the resin formula's interaction with the human body. I say, may undergo because it is up to each manufacturer to decide which tests they do. This is the case because these types of materials, when created, are often formulated with a specific use case in mind. It's why Splint, likely, has such a creative name, and why B9 has four different biocompatibles with varying ratings of length of use. 
Each resin is formulated, tested, and sold under specific use cases, often to assure that there are no negative, unforeseen effects when put into its final use. A lot of these materials can last between 30 days, a couple of months, and like splint, up to two years, because they're used for varying purposes, from a basic external use case to an internal guide during surgery, or again, like splint, something that stays in the mouth for 10 to 12 hours a day for up to that two year period. Now, because of the varying lifespan and varying use cases of all of these biocompatible resins, the FDA actually recommends that manufacturers consider the composition of the materials, uh, the manufacturing processes that will be used, or the intended use of the end device in regards to the resin formula and its toxic effects. For those that want to print items to eat from or items that come in contact with the body on a regular basis, this means that although the manufacturer should be taking a margin of error into account during the testing process, it's unlikely that they have thought of every issue that could occur if regular 3D printers were using these biocompatibles. In the same way you could have a warranty claim denied for using a product inappropriately, uh, these materials are often so specific to that one end use case that it's not even considered for any other purpose during that testing, other than that margin for error. Depending on that end use case, you might not even be able to purchase some of these biocompatible materials unless you're a dental technician or work elsewhere in the medical field. Fortunately, we've been lucky enough to form a great relationship with Mac4D around their castable line and a few of their other resins, which has allowed us some leeway to play around with their biocompatibles. Although we've been playing around with Splint for quite some time now, we're not sure that all manufacturers are ready to take on the risk of making a biocompatible with as much room for error as would be needed for the regular pro-consumer. However, if it were possible to get a biocompatible available to the general market, there are a lot of fantastic applications that we can see for this material. For those of you that are really observant, you may have noticed that I'm actually wearing a biocompatible. Because of the fact that we're not dental technicians, when we were given this bottle of splint, we had a hard time figuring out what we would do with it to test the printing capabilities and then the end printed result. In looking for a way to test and look at this resin, we decided to start printing some of our ear weights and ear hangers in the biocompatible. They're no longer in the realm of an ear weight, but they are really amazing and actually quite beautiful. One of the reasons that we're so excited for the hopefully eventual possibility of a biocompatible for the regular prosumer market is because we're looking to expand on this testing that we've done and create pieces for modified individuals that are in a relatively quick to use and safe material. For those of you that aren't familiar with body modification or ear stretching, when you go to stretch your ears, you need to be using a biocompatible or hypoallergenic material for the best possible results and for the safest stretch. If we were to be able to find a consumer level biocompatible, it would be a great option because it's a lower price point material than a gold, a titanium, or another metal hypoallergenic material. And because of that biocompatible application, it can stay in the ear, in the body, for a longer period of time. Even with some metals that are being used for ear stretching, you do need to remove that plug or that tunnel and make sure it's cleaned on a regular basis. Although hygiene is presumably important with something like this, potentially you could be leaving that in your stretched lobe or in your other modification for a longer period of time. It also allows for functionality and one-off pieces that might not be physically possible in metal. All of that being said though, that is just our hope and our wish for where biocompatibles are heading in our current market. As I previously said, I'm not even sure if most manufacturers are ready for that margin of error that could be possible when having a mass amount of printers using their material. 
If you're excited for biocompatibles and what that could possibly mean for the 3D printing space, leave a comment below letting us know what you would use this material for. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave them down in that comment section as well. If you're having trouble printing in any material, let alone a biocompatible, or are looking for some casting help or other education and help, please feel free to click that join button down below this video to get a more one-on-one -on -one experience with us in our Discord community. That's it for this video. I hope you guys learned something. We will see you in the next one.